Well, good morning and welcome again to Cross Community. We want to take a minute and just say uh, good morning to those of you who are watching online, those of you at our Pecola campus. We don't always get to see each other face to face, but we're grateful for an opportunity to gather uh, together to worship, uh, to look into the Word of God. And really, we're grateful for the work that God does in us both individually and corporately as a body. And so uh, it was just a joy to sit up here and to hear you guys uh, singing and, and worshiping. Uh, today, I, I say like the, the, thing, the singing and, and worshiping thing because uh, it's not exactly an easy time uh, in our country or in our nation. It's one of those times where uh, what I want to do is turn off the news or like just totally avoid everything you're hearing because you don't know who to believe and what's going on. It's uncertain about the future. Uh, it's just not a super fun time uh, in our entire country. You might be completely sick of politics. You're like, is it ever going to end. Uh, you see division. It's, again, not a real fun time in our country. And today I want to talk to you about hope and really hope for the future and hope in, in the midst of a future that may not go the way that we would ultimately want things to go, it, but it's hope in Christ and it's hope that the God that we just sang praises to is in control, he's on his throne, and that he's still doing a good work even in the midst of difficulty. When Paul wrote the letter to the church at Philippians, or at Philippi, the Philippian believers there, uh, it wasn't a, a particularly favorable time to be a believer. A few years prior Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the Roman emperor at the time, he declared himself to be God. And he uh, decreed that men would have to bow down to an image of his. There was a, a, a huge Jewish revolt, and it looked like, hey, the tide's going to turn, the Jews are going to have their nation, things are going to be really, really good. But then the revolt was put down. And Antiochus Epiphanes, this brutal ruler who killed countless Christians, went into the Jewish temple and he slaughtered a pig on the altar, desecrating the altar in the Jewish temple. It was one of those times where you would have thought, and all hope is lost. Things are never going to get better. It's only going to get worse. Just a short time after that, John the Baptist began declaring, prepare the way. One who's coming after me who's greater than I am. And Jesus is born in the manger in a little town called Bethlehem, a place no one would have expected it. The, the God came in flesh. The Messiah of the world was here. Paul is writing a letter to the church at Philippi that had begun to experience just a glimmer of what God was ultimately going to do. The circumstances were pretty dire. As a matter of fact, when he showed up in the city and began to preach, he didn't find Christians there. He didn't even find very many Jews in the city. So he goes out by, by the river. He finds some ladies praying. He articulates the gospel. And if you were here a couple of weeks ago, you know that Paul was just rejoicing in the fact that a lady named Lydia and her family had come to faith in Christ there. That a jailer in the city and his family had come to faith in Jesus Christ. He's rejoicing in that. And then if you were here last week, you know that Paul is rejoicing in his current circumstances. Which he was in prison in Rome. Likely chained to a Roman guard. And yet he's like, hey, God's doing a thing here, y'all. Like, uh, Just because I'm chained doesn't mean the gospel isn't going forth. Today we're going to see that Paul continues rejoicing. He rejoiced in the past. Remember what happened at Philippi? He rejoiced in his present circumstances, though he was in chains. And in verse 18 of Philippians chapter 1, he's going to continue to rejoice, looking forward to the future. Here's what he says. He says, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this... All of this that he's feeling, everything that he's experiencing, all that he's seeing, I know that this will turn out. I know that this circumstance, these difficulties, the, the, the goings on, these things are going to turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, many of us read that and we're like, we think, Physical circumstances, right? Like the word deliverance. If you were to kind of read in the literature, the various scholars who've commented on this text, there are two major schools of thought. That this word deliverance is Paul talking about his current circumstances. Now, I'm just going to be honest. 
if I'm in a Roman prison, I'm in chains, I'm not free to go, and I'm writing you a letter, and I talk about deliverance, I'm probably talking about, like, no longer being in prison, right? If I'm awaiting to stand trial before Caesar, who may say he dies and he may say he lives, and I'm writing to you about deliverance, I'm talking about my personal deliverance. Like, I'm going to get away from these circumstances, no more chains, no more guards, I'll be free. And many people that would espouse that idea would say, sure, that's what Paul's talking about here. I mean, the Philippian believers, they're praying for Paul, likely wanted to see him no longer uh, jailed. They're probably praying that he won't be killed at the hands of Caesar. I, I told you about the Roman emperors. They were not kind to Christians. They'd probably seen um, crosses lining the streets in their lifetime where Christians, for as far as they could see, had been crucified for being Christians. And so you can bet the Philippian believers were praying that Paul would be delivered, that his life might continue, that he might not have to spend um, all of his days in chains. Later in this text, Paul's going to mention the hope that he would see the Philippian believers again. And so yeah, I think when Paul says the word deliverance here, yes, and I will rejoice for I know this will turn out for my deliverance, he was probably, he had the sense of, yeah, physically I want to be delivered. But then other scholars would argue the other side of that when they use the word deliverance. They would point out that Paul is actually quoting from the Old Testament book of Job. And if you know the story of Job, he was uber wealthy. I mean, he had it going on, nice house, nice cars. He had a great family. Like, life was going well for Job until God allowed him to be tested. And we find Job having lost all of his wealth. His family was gone. He has boils covering his body. And one of his friends said, Job, you should just curse God and die. To that, Job replies in Job chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. He utters these words, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways before him. This also will be my salvation. The word that Paul used for salvation in the Hebrew translates into Greek this word that Paul used for deliverance. And so many scholars would be like, see, he's quoting Job. He's not talking about, I'm going to get out of prison, you guys. I'm hoping that my life's going to be spared. What Paul is talking about here is that when he dies, all that he's done for God, like his relationship, his walk, like he's going to ultimately be saved one day. So this is really talking about his salvation right here. Like, And so I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. I also pray that one day I'm going to be in heaven with God, right? Like, and so you can see that there's a sense in which Paul would be like, I want physical deliverance, and I also, of course, spiritually delivered, want to spend eternity in heaven with God. But I, I really believe that there was more going on here than merely physical or spiritual deliverance. I think the deliverance that Paul is talking about here is deliverance from the things that you and I experience every single day. It's deliverance from the struggles that we have when we look at the weakness of our flesh. Paul has been called to be an apostle, to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. At this point, he's supposed to represent Christ well in the midst of an imprisonment, being chained and you know he had his good moments, right? I mean, he's writing the letter, and he's like, look, the Praetorian Guard, they're hearing the gospel. People throughout the city, they're encouraged. But you know what? I'm also confident that, God, that Paul had those difficult moments of doubt where fear crept in. Maybe Paul remembered his past and how not only had he not represented Christ well, he persecuted Christians. He held the coats of men who took rocks and beat believers to death. I don't think the enemy wasn't working on Paul. Like, hey, Paul, remember your past? Oh, you're being faithful now, but what about when you stand before Caesar? What about what's coming? 
I'm sure Paul had fears that his faith might wane or waver, that he might fail, that he might not stand for the gospel. For you and I, it probably looks a little bit different in our circumstances. You're probably not thinking about your trial before Caesar, if you are, uh, you seek help, right? But if you're, if you're a normal believer here in this world, like you're living and breathing, existing as a Christian in the United States of America, you're probably having similar struggles in your own mind. For me, it often comes out like this, like, Man, am I, am I being the kind of dad that I need to be? Look at my kids. In some moments, I'm like, I think we're doing okay. And then other moments, you're like, no, I'm totally failing. Or in my marriage, am I being the husband God wants me to be? Or as a pastor, am I doing all the things that God would want me to be? Can I uh, look with hope toward the future that God's going to do great things in my family, in my marriage, in our church? Like, can I, can I respond with Paul like I'm rejoicing because I know that even though I have weakness in my flesh, that there's going to be a deliverance. I believe the deliverance here that Paul is talking about is from the weakness of his own flesh. The weakness that he talked about when he said, I've got a thorn in my flesh, it makes me limp. It probably had something to do with his, you know, I'm in chains. It probably had to do with salvation, but I believe the primary thing Paul is focused on is not totally blowing it in his Christian life. Look, look what he says as we read on. He says, yes, and I will rejoice for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame. Now, if Paul's talking about physical deliverance, as long as he's faithful, he's not put to shame whether he lives or he dies, right? And then when you think about, like, salvation, I won't be put to shame, what does that even mean? Like, Jesus is the one who died on the cross for our sins. Like, he took all of our sin and our shame and our guilt, so why would he be talking about salvation? And what Paul, again, is talking about when he says deliverance here is from his own weakness, from his own struggles, from his own sin, from the fear that he might not represent Christ well, he might not live his life well, and that he, in some way he might fail, he might let God down, or he might not do the things that he wanted. But he's rejoicing, remember. He has hope through the prayers of the Philippian believers, through the provision of the Spirit, that he would not be put to shame in any way, but that with all boldness Christ would, even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's hope is that he would do it well, that he could look back on his life and not have regret, wishing he would have said something, wishing he would have stepped forward, wishing he would have lived more boldly for Christ. What Paul is confident that he's rejoicing in here is that he's not going to be ashamed, he's not going to waver, but whether by life or by death, Christ will be exalted in him. And he rejoices here. God's got this. I don't think Paul's all that concerned about his circumstances, whether by life or by death. Only that Christ may be exalted in me. Whether I'm free or I'm in chains, only that Christ may be exalted in me. Can I encourage you to think about your own life for just a second? You think about the future. Oftentimes, when we think about what's coming, when we think about, God, I want deliverance, you know what we're talking about? The circumstances? Maybe it's your weakness. Maybe you feel like, in a sense, you're carrying around chains, you're not free, you're not living it. You're, maybe you're worried about the circumstances of our culture, and you're praying, you're crying out to God, like, I want deliverance, right? I want to be honest with you. We cannot hope for deliverance from our circumstances. You can't put your hope in that. We don't know what God's plan is. God knows. For us, life may get way better. You may make more money. You know, kids may thrive. Everything may go well. Or it could be a really difficult time for us. But as believers, we can persist in hope. And we can rejoice because... We have an opportunity in the midst of these circumstances to live a life that exalts Christ. Whether the times are really good in life or whether the times get really, really bad and we ultimately begin to suffer. 
Paul goes on here and he describes kind of his, his thinking. This is one of those coffee cup verses. You've probably heard it, uh, you know, kind of inspires you in a, a brave heart kind of way. He says, for verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, I don't know about you. Half of this verse I get, like just, just half of it, though. Like the whole idea that to die is gain, I am fully with Paul in that. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I'm a believer in Jesus. I didn't deserve that. But Jesus died on the cross for my sin that I might be reconciled to God. He's taken my sin, my guilt, my shame. He's credited to me his righteousness so that I am very confident as I stand here today. I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus one day. No more laboring, no more striving, no more suffering, no more anxiety about the world. Like it's going to be perfect, right? A new heaven, a new earth. I'm going to have a new body, y'all. It's like things are going to be perfect. Man, to die is gain. Like I look forward to those days. It's the other half of the verse that I kind of struggle with. It's the side where Paul Say, for me, to live is Christ. If I keep on living, it's going to be as if Christ is here. Like, I'm going to live a life that brings honor and glory to Christ. He just said, whether I live or I die, that Christ would be exalted in this body So Paul, with confidence, he's saying, for me, to live is Christ. That means, like, Christ is going to be present here. He begins to kind of tease this out a little bit. He says in verse 22, But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I don't know which to choose. I'm hard-pressed from both directions. Having the desire to depart to be with Christ, for that is much better. Amen, right? Heaven, everybody wants that. That's where we all want to be. But then he says this thing. But it really caught me for the first time. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So we step away from 2,000 years ago when a guy in prison writing a letter to a church that we've probably never visited. And we look at the word of God today. Can I ask this question? Do you have this hard-pressed feeling Like as a believer in Jesus Christ, are you feeling that hard press between, yes, one day I want to go and be united with Christ, but believing that in you, in your life, fruitful labor lies ahead? Do you believe that? Like if you continue on in this life that God's going to use you and bear fruit through your life, like things are going to be different. Your life is going to be as Christ, like as if Jesus were living through you. Do you believe that? Do you wrestle with the tension that, yes, I want to be with Jesus, but also believing that your presence here for as long as God leaves you here is necessary for somebody or something. Like that God has seen fit to keep you here. To place you here in the midst of these circumstances, the world that we live in, the neighborhood that you're in, the job that you're in, the school that you're in, that God has said, hey, it's necessary that you remain here. That your life might bear much fruit. Maybe God isn't so concerned about fixing all the outward circumstances of your life. What he's really concerned is that he might be glorified whether you live or you die. That you might he might be glorified in your body whether things are really good or things get really bad. Can I just tell you y'all that this is like this is discipleship 101. What Paul is talking about here is not like, oh, I'm a super apostle, like me and Jesus, we're just like this. I'm the most spiritual man ever. What Paul is talking about is the attitude of everyone who's ever followed Jesus Christ, what we ought to be as disciples of his. That, hey, Jesus, man, I don't know what's coming. I don't know which direction you're leading in my life. But what I believe is that you have called me according to your purpose. And so uh, whatever comes, whether life or by death, whether by good circumstances or bad, I'm just going to represent you here. And whether I make a ton of money or I'm pretty poor for much of my life, whether I live in the biggest house or something smaller, whether things are really great, good health or bad, Jesus, that you might be exalted in my life. Now, Paul is not confident, by the way, in his own flesh. 
Paul would say about himself, I'm the chief of sinners. He's like, have you done it? I've done it bigger. And I've sinned more than anybody. Like, if you were to look at Paul's past, you would not be like, oh, yes, this man's going to be used for Jesus. But Paul's hope is not in his pedigree, his past, not in, in, in any other thing. Paul's hope is ultimately in the prayers of some people in Philippi and the provision of the Spirit. Look, look what he says. Jump back up to verse 19. He says, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. I know that I'm not going to be ashamed. I know that I don't have to worry about failing and falling and like not representing Jesus well. I know this is going to turn out for my deliverance. And he says, here's where deliverance comes from. Here's what I'm hoping in. Here's where this earnest expectation that I'm never going to be ashamed, but that I'm going to stand for Jesus, whether in, in life or in death. Here's where it comes from. Turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Many of us in this room, we're pretty confident in the weakness of our flesh. You know your story. You know where you've been. You know the things that you've done. And you're like, no, I'm weak. What I know is that I could never make a difference in my family. Like, I've tried. I've had some conversations. Didn't go well. I'm really confident in the weakness of my flesh. The question is are you more confident in the provision of the Holy Spirit of God? Like, have you gained confidence in who God is and His overwhelming power to take a man who one day had committed his life to persecuting the Christian church, who'd stood there while Christians were murdered, who probably high-fived the guys who threw the rocks. Could, could you believe that God could take a guy like that and use him to take the gospel to a group of ladies down by a river in the city of Philippi to be the first converts to Christianity in the whole continent of Europe, that God would do this extraordinary work? Do you you believe in the power and the provision of the Spirit like that through you. This is normal discipleship, y'all, that we don't live as we are, that we don't look in the mirror and be like, no, I don't have it. Like, I, I, I've, I've done some things. Like, I've got weakness. I don't speak very well. Like, I'm just not good at this whole deal. Like, that's not at all how we're supposed to live focused on ourselves, the Scripture would say, but you fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of your faith. And then we run the race that's marked out for us. Paul's confident. Whatever comes, I don't have to worry about being ashamed. I don't have to worry that I'm not going to exalt Christ as I should. But I'm confident. I'm rejoicing knowing that I'm going to be delivered from the weakness of my flesh through the prayers of a church in a city called Philippi and through the provision of the Holy Spirit his flesh was weak, but the Spirit was far more powerful than the weakness of his flesh. So for us, as the Church of Jesus Christ, 2021, in a little city called Poto, a little city called Pecola, or whatever town you may live in around here, how are we to claim, as Paul claimed here, for me, not just to die as gain, but for us to begin to believe and for us to begin to live out that to live is Christ. That if we continue on this planet, it's going to be like Jesus is walking in our body. That he's living out through us. For us to continue here to believe that our continued life on this earth, it's necessary and it's going to be fruitful labor. Just a couple of things I want to point out to you today. How do we begin to live as Christ? No longer walking in the weakness of our flesh, but in the power and the provision of the Holy Spirit. That's number one. We begin to live through the provision of the Spirit of God in our lives. You, you've heard us say this like hopefully dozens of times. You've been here very long. We tell you, we remind you, like we encourage you over and over and over to devote yourselves daily to Jesus Christ. Like you would get up every morning, and this isn't just like I'm going to read a little bit and then I'm going to pray, but your whole day would say, hey, Jesus, today I want you to be exalted in my body. I want you to be exalted through me. De Jesus, I pray today that this might be fruitful service for you. I know it's not going to happen through me, and so I'm going to come to you that I'm going to seek the daily bread. Jesus, 
would you work through this weak vessel today? And so what it looks like is what Jesus told us to pray in Mark chapter 8. He's like, if anyone would come after me, if you want to be a disciple of mine, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. You want to gain life? You want to know what it is to, to, to live out in true and abundant life? you got to be willing to give yours up. So it's denying ourselves, seeking the provision of the Spirit. So we get up every day. Jesus, this is not about my life. I belong to you. So would you glorify yourself in me? Yes, I know my story. I know the ugly things that have happened in my life. I know the sinful tendencies. But Jesus, through your power, can I live a victorious life where you bear fruit through me? And knowing just how weak my flesh is, I'm going to praise you for every good thing, knowing that it didn't come through me. Devoting ourselves daily to Jesus Christ, where he begins to transform our hearts, learning to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit, who would lead us in those moments, who kind of does the, the, the gentle shoulder tap in the midst of the conversation where you realize, hey, I have an opportunity for Jesus to be exalted right now. I have an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have an opportunity to serve someone, to love someone, to give to someone where we would be literally just living as Christ. Like if Christ was in that conversation, like we'd be doing what he would be doing. We seek the provision of the Spirit. That's what Paul rejoiced in. Not in his extensive knowledge. Not in his ability to be a killer Pharisee. Like, not in any of the other things. He's rejoicing, believing in his deliverance from weakness, from turning away through the prayers of the church of Philippi and the provision of the Holy Spirit. I think people get bored with Christianity. Like, the football game on Sunday is far more exciting than Christianity is. Because you've never learned to, to walk through the provision of the Holy Spirit. You've never seen God do things in you and through you that you cannot explain by the weakness of your own flesh. <laughs> the command of Jesus, hey, you want to you follow me? Deny yourself and take up your cross. And begin to follow me. And God begins to bear fruit in our lives, not because of us, but because of who he is. Because of his great power. That your friends and family might take notice like... I've known him. I've grown up with her. I know her, but something is different because of the work of Jesus Christ. The second thing that Paul mentions here that helps him know that this is going to turn out for his deliverance is through the prayers of a group of people in Philippi. The prayers of the saints. His confidence and his joy that he wouldn't be ashamed, that Christ would be exalted in him, came through the prayers of the Philippians who were participants in the gospel with him. He knew they had his back. He knew that they were praying for him. I mean, if you could think about someone that you loved, someone that you cared about, they're in prison, they're being persecuted for the sake of, of Jesus Christ, like you'd be with them in prayer, right? But I think they were also praying, not again just for his deliverance, like in the physical sense, but also, God, would you help him to stand strong? And Paul's in the middle of it. He's in prison. He's about to stand before Caesar. Would you give him the grace, God, that he might stand strong? Did you know that in your circumstances, you need people praying for you too? Just as Paul was just hopeful and, and, and desiring that he wouldn't shrink back, that he wouldn't give way to fear, that he wouldn't turn away from the Lord, you too have the potential in any circumstance to turn away from the Lord, to, to do things you're going to be ashamed of, to wish you would have stood up when, when you didn't. And you need people in your life that are going to battle with you. What he said about the Philippian believers, again, this, it, 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 he was thankful for their partnership in the gospel. The, the Greek word there is koinonia. It's this deep, rich, abiding fellowship. Like Think of it like uh, this is a group of people who have locked arms together with me. They are striving with me for the progress of the gospel. They're striving with me that we might pursue Christ together. The first thing is seeking the provision of the Spirit. We said devote yourselves daily. Learn to hear the voice of God. Learn the word of God. Learn to walk with God. Submit yourselves to Him. The thing that we also say around here is commit yourselves to community. 
that if you're going to have confidence like Paul did, that you're in no way going to need to be ashamed. When you look back on your life, you're not going to be like, man, I wish I would have done it better. wish I would have done it different. You need people in your life that you have this koinonia, this type of fellowship together with. That you're locking arms and saying, we are going to chase after Jesus. Like, we're going to live it. We're going to do it. We're going to be looking forward to fruitful ministry in our lives. We see that God has placed us here, and therefore, we are necessary in our circumstances to bear witness to Jesus. That you have a group of people that are praying for you, like, every day as you go out. Can I just tell you, our community groups here are not another Bible study. Nothing wrong with studying the Bible. It's not another daggum fellowship, Lord knows. We don't need another fellowship, right? Just to eat. Like, this is us getting together and saying, we're going to live for Jesus Christ. And some of you, you're out there and you're just doing it on your own. You're stumbling your way through. Why is this so daggum hard? I can't seem to live for Jesus. Two things Paul put his hope in. The two things he points to that he was confident in. The provision of the Spirit. And the prayers of his brothers and sisters who are in it with him. If you're not connected to a group in this church, man, we would love an opportunity to plug you in with a group of people that are ready to run their race too. Who are ready to exemplify Christ in the midst of their circumstances. If you're in a group, sitting there answering a bunch of questions from your mind, it's like, you know, just going through the motions like another class, and you're missing out. And tonight, like, Sit down with those people. This week when you meet, you sit down and be like, hey, let me tell you where my weakness lies. And here's my biggest sin. If, I'm, if, if the enemy's going to take me down, it's going to be here. Would you labor with me in prayer? Here's the person that I'm praying for, that I'll have an opportunity to lead them to Christ. This year, would you pray for me that I won't be ashamed, but I will speak the word of God with boldness when the opportunities come. The church of Jesus Christ isn't supposed to be a bunch of disconnected parts that all kind of, you know, you come together once a week, you hear the sermon, you do the thing, and then you just kind of go live life as normal people, hoping that God's going to fix your circumstances. Man, the church of Jesus Christ has been called into some of, some of the most difficult circumstances the world has ever seen to point people to true life in Jesus Christ. Y'all, it's totally good that you believe that to die is gain. And you look forward to heaven, and we should. Face to face with Jesus, like, awesome. But I hope we don't miss out on the other side of this. Where we see that we are to live as Christ. To begin living for Jesus right here and right now. Some people see salvation, Christianity, it's like you got a ticket, and you got on a train, and one day you're going to arrive at your destination, and everything's going to be fine. For the next few years, you just kind of put her in autopilot, stay comfortably in your seat, don't, you know, cause any trouble, and life will be good. One day you'll be delivered to your destination. Christianity is more like a rowboat, and you're in the boat, and together with your brothers and sisters, like you're moving forward together, knowing one day you're going to reach your destination. That's the work of God. That's the power of the Spirit in you, but you're in this thing together. And today we have an opportunity to run after Jesus Christ, to seek first his kingdom. So today my encouragement for you is just to see a couple of things in your life. The overwhelming power of the Holy Spirit. The necessity of the prayers of your brothers and sisters in this church. And the necessity of your participation in the midst of these circumstances that the gospel might go forward. Now, so far in Philippians, we've seen Paul rejoice in the past. And Lydia and the jailer. Remember that slave girl and Paul cast out the demon? Really powerful, awesome. He's rejoiced in his present circumstances. The gospel went out to the praetorian guard and all the city of Rome. Last week, I told you about being in Rome and the catacombs and that hundreds of thousands of believers came to faith in Jesus Christ as a result of this faithful ministry of an average, ordinary Christian whose name was Paul. This week, I was having a discussion with my oldest son going over some homework stuff. He said, Dad... Did you know that there are 2.3 billion Christians in the world? I don't know. You can dispute the number, but that's what his homework had said. And I, honestly, I didn't know there were that many. But can you imagine Paul? Yes, 
and I will rejoice. I know this is going to turn out for my deliverance. I won't be ashamed, but Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. What I believe is that if I'm to live in the flesh, uh, man, it's going to be fruitful labor in my life. When you think about fruitful labor, I don't think Paul could have ever imagined 2.3 billion Christians in the world. Like, I think his mind would have been blown. Like, he would have just, like, talk about rejoicing. It would have been even bigger than that. Can I challenge you this morning to begin to ask God, begin to believe, begin to dream a little bit that what God may want to do in your life and in your family and in your workplace and in those hopeless situations is that he might want to do something that you can't even imagine, that you wouldn't even be able to dream of. And then imagine that he wants to use you. And imagine rejoicing that you don't have to be afraid that somehow you're going to fail, that you're going to look back and need to be ashamed. But through the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ, and through the provision of the Spirit, you can rejoice that your deliverance is coming. That God himself is at work in you. And to imagine... It's your family, your workplace, your school, our city, our country will be profoundly different because God used you. Do you believe God is that big? Do you believe God is that powerful? If that's you today, I want to pray for you. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, I think sometimes we, we get so focused on the weakness of our flesh that we miss out on the absolute and overwhelming power of our God. Lord, you took a man named Paul. You allowed him to be beaten with rods, placed in a prison, and a jailer came to faith in a city called Philippi. You allowed him to be imprisoned again in Rome. The Praetorian Guard comes to know you. Other believers are encouraged. More believers in the city of Rome. Hundreds of thousands of Christians were saved. Lord, I don't know what this story might look like for the person who's sitting uh, there today for my life and for their life. But Father, we, we rejoice in what is to come. We rejoice and we look forward. We anticipate. We eagerly await fruitful labor in our lives. We know that you've called us. You placed us here, that you have a race marked out for us to run. And I pray that the church of Jesus Christ, who call ourselves Cross Community Church, God, that we would we believe in the power of your spirit, that we would believe in the power of the prayer on our behalf, and God, that we would live as Christ until we die as gain. Father, would you bear fruit in our hearts? We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.